Art Chat is made possible by the support of the Artistics Harmonies Association. Create your next aha experience with us. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Art Chat. Today, I have Joe McGurl with me. We're going to talk about past masters, his favorite, um, basically the masters that have influenced him and what we can learn from studying them. And then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the pandemic and how that affected Joe as an artist, as well as the art business. Then we're going to jump into talking. It's probably going to be all pulled together. We probably won't like go ABC, but uh, we'll also talk a little bit about capturing atmosphere because it is elusive. And um, I think how we all see it is probably even different as well. But maybe Joe can give us some great tips for capturing atmosphere. So how you been, Joe? Been very well, thanks. How Good. are you? Doing well. I knew you've been down in Florida for a while. Did you sail down to Florida and back? No, no, we have a condo there. So we spend the, spend the fall and the spring there. Ah, okay. Just to get out of the dreary New England wind, uh, <laughs> fall and spring. Yeah, I'm I don't mind the winter. I like the snow, but when it's just gray and rainy and drizzly, it's time yeah. to go. Yeah, I used to live in Ohio and I have since moved to Asheville, North Carolina. And oh my gosh, the weather differences. Well, the views too. So I can understand. So, okay. So I was going to move ahead with um, I have a, just for those who are listening uh, through the podcast, I have a PowerPoint that we're going to be talking from that will be posted out on YouTube. So when we're starting to talk about um, the past masters and some of Joe's work and all that, if you go out to YouTube, you'll actually see the paintings that we're talking about and uh, the work, some of Joe's work and different things like that. So just so you know, um, it's Linda Riesenberg Fistler. If you Google Linda Fistler and our chats, it should come up with the YouTube link as well. So um, first thing I want to talk about, though, too, is a little announcement that if you've if you pay attention to the artwork that is out on Spotify and Pandora and Buzzsprout and another of, of, of all the other podcast places that you listen from, you probably noticed that the Art Chat logo has changed. And that is because Art Chat is being incorporated into an association called Artistic Harmonies Association. So, um, and they are also sponsoring the webs or the Art Chat now. We're just getting started uh, with Artistic Harmonies Association, but I wanted to, for my podcast listeners, talk a little bit about Artistic Harmonies' mission and their vision statement, and then we'll have more about that. We're going to do a, a uh, podcast-specific show about Artistic Harmonies Association in a couple weeks. But um, basically, the mission of Artistic Harmonies is to bring light to the creative passions of artists who want to develop technical and creative mastery. And then our vision statement is advising creatives throughout their artistic journey to achieve new levels of success through our innovative procedures. I, I, if I had a website to tell you guys to go to, I'd give it to you, but we're in the, <laughs> in the middle of developing all of that. But this is really exciting work. Um, I'm one of the co-founders. Another one of the co-founders, John Anderson, has a very wonderful business background especially working with creative entrepreneurs. And uh, we see some pretty cool stuff happening in the weeks and months and years to come. So we're getting closer and closer to launch. So hang in there. Like I said, we'll have a podcast on this specific thing in the coming months. So let's talk about Joe now. So I am not going to read Joe's bio, but basically Joe is unquestionably one of the most sought after and influential landscape artists currently working in America. I thought it was interesting, Joe, that you actually worked with your father, James, and there's going to be one of the masters that did that, worked with his father. So I thought that was a really cool parallel when I was doing all the research on the, on the masters. So, and Joe's father was a muralist and um, his most influential teacher, which I wonder why. <laughs> Was your dad good? I mean, was he, he wasn't like real stern or anything, was he? Oh, no, he was the mellowest person you could ever meet. Very kind and incredibly supportive. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, just a really wonderful role model. He was an incredibly hard worker, too. Oh, nice. nice. Uh, he had five kids to support, so he would never say no to a job. And we had some crazy jobs over the years. <laughs> <laughs> he would do everything, you know, gold leafing, stenciling, murals. 
um, imitation stained glass, marbleizing, wood graining, uh, yeah. some uh, easel painting, not a whole lot of easel painting. Yeah, well, that explains a lot of your um, exploration. And I wonder what this will do on a canvas. I remember having a conversation with you about finding let's see, the, the, um, the brush that was used to glaze the turkey. You ended up walking off with that, I think, at some point. And, yeah. <laughs> and then some rollers and different things like that. So it's always an interesting conversation when Joe and I get together and, and talk about art tools and different things like that. So along with the education that James McGurl gave Joe, he also graduated from the Massachusetts College of Art and studied in England and Italy. So, and Joe is also interested in modern physics and the nature of reality combined with the spiritual, with the spiritual he finds in nature and how that has resulted in a thoroughly modern approach to style and subject. And the reason why I bring that up is because I think most of our conversation around the past masters and um, why Joe likes him so much is going to center on his interest here um, as well. So let's go ahead and, and, and dive in, Joe, to the first favorite master. And I took these in order that you sent them to me, starting with Frederick Church, who was born in um, 1826. He passed in the 1900s. He was a central figure in the Hudson River School. Um, he painted large landscapes and depicting mostly mountains, waterfalls, and sunsets, it says. So, um, and he had emphasis on real, uh, a realistic detail and dramatic light and panoramic views. So I could see right up front one reason why you were drawn to Frederick Church, because when I look at this, I see a lot of his um, work or style, however you want to say that, uh, I see that in your work as well. So tell us a little bit about why you like Frederick Church and what drew you to him. And um, and I got a couple photos of, if you want to talk about the specific photograph of, the, of their work, that's fine too. So I will um, be quiet now and you can <laughs> go for it. <laughs> well, I think the first thing that drew me to them was when I was in about fourth grade, until I graduated from high school, I spent Saturdays at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston taking art classes. And I'd walk through the galleries that had the 19th century landscapes. And I was just totally in awe the way they could make things look so real and lifelike. And I think that's the first thing that impresses you is there's a naturalism and the artist disappears. You really don't, you're not aware of the artist's hand in, in these paintings. They're focusing on nature and the sublime and, and that's really the subject whereas other pa painting styles they really focus on the artist and it's his hand and it's like say van gogh for instance it's very obvious that van gogh painted that and it's also you can see his handwriting and his brush marks and such mm -hmm. where the 19th century landscape painters in particular tried to eliminate themselves from the scene and focus on nature and the subject matter so that was the first thing that just impressed me, how they were able to render these things so beautifully and lifelike and um, convincing. Uh, then I grew up in Quincy, which isn't too far from Concord, and I was aware of the transcendentalists, uh, Thoreau and Emerson and Margaret Fuller and such, and their philosophy a little bit, and not so much church, but Sanford Gifford and the, um, the luminous painters, which I'll get to in a minute. Mm -hmm. all uh, were influenced by the transcendentalists and I knew I'd been to Walden Pond and that sort of permeated my uh, my psyche uh, this whole idea of um, spirituality in the landscape and the transcendentalists and I um, you know, was an admirer of their philosophies so that kind of drew me towards their style of painting also mm -hmm. and um, I think it was mostly Initially, it was the technique and the ability to capture reality and nature. And then after that, it was the um, sort of the underlying reason for their painting, the philosophy underpinning their artwork that really appealed to me and still does to this day. And Frederick Church was the leader of the, that landscape school. He was a student of Thomas Cole, who was America, pretty much America's first major landscape painter. And then Frederick Church became sort of the leader of the landscape painting school in America in the 1860s and 1870s. 
Uh, it was called the Hudson River School because a lot of those painters often went to the Hudson River and painted it along the, the river banks, but they also traveled throughout New England and upstate New York. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think Frederick Church, maybe more than any other artist, epitomizes that style of painting. A lot of them are grandiose, very large paintings, and uh, often dramatic lighting, and, uh, a lot of sunsets and storms, approaching storms and such. And a lot of those artists also painted sort of the the weather was really important to them too, not just the depicting the the landscape, but you can almost feel the humidity or the sunlight or the hot, the heat in their paintings. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they worked also the way that I also work, which is painting small studies on location and then going back into the studio and using those studies to develop large studio paintings. But often with their work as in mind, it's not a, it's just a transcription of what we saw. I'll often make major changes. Uh, a great deal of my paintings are made up, completely made up, but they're made up based on what I've learned from painting nature outside for so many years. So I can paint a tree so it looks convincingly like a tree mm -hmm. because I've done it so many times, plein air painting. And that's the way the uh, Hudson River School painters painted too quite often. There's a famous painting of a church as Cotopaxi, which is this volcano erupting in South America. And there's an enormous lake in front of it, but there's no lake there in reality at all. Huh? So he added the lake. And you, you know, you, you would never know that it wasn't there the way he rendered it and depicted it. But they would often do things like that. And I do too. We don't, we're not slavish to the the subject and the the, the actual topography. We take a lot of liberties for the sake of art, because we're creating art really more than um, describing something. We're yeah. trying to convey an emotion and a philosophy. Right. So um, two, two questions. When you talked about basically the, the landscape itself is the feature and that you're creating nature and the spirituality that is nature. Um, what popped into my head was the voice is more the subject versus our voice depicting the subject. Is that, would that be like a correct way of talking about that? Yes, it's, it's sort of, as I mentioned before, like the artist's hand disappears. Mm -hmm. The artist isn't the subject, we're with Van Gogh the artist is the subject. When you see a Van Gogh painting, the first thing you think of is Van Gogh. And his personality is all over that painting because of you know the directness of his, his brush marks and his handwriting. Yeah. Where with the Hudson River School painters, the first thing you look at is nature and you don't see the, the hand of the artist. You see his underlying philosophy, but that sort of creeps in through the back door where like Van Gogh, it hits you in the face. Like mm -hmm. I'm Vincent Van Gogh, bang. With Frederick Church, it's like, oh, it's an amazing landscape. And then you say, oh, is that a Frederick Church painting? Now it could be Church or it could be Gifford or uh, Bierstadt. I mean, they all painted somewhat similarly. I can tell right away who was who because I've been studying it for so long. Right, right. But most people, you know, a Church and a Bierstadt and a Gifford, they all kind of, you know, look the same somewhat but like a um van gogh and that's someone's deliberately copying his style but his contemporaries he wasn't none of his contemporaries were painting like him at all okay he was totally unique yeah and you know church was unique but then he had people who were inspired by him and you had that with van gogh too right but with, with uh van gogh it's much more you know his imprint is on the scene where with church his imprint disappears and the scene sort of takes preeminence you certainly can get lost in either painting i mean if you're a big van gogh fan you can get lost in that as well um but i i do love this style i'm not sure i have the patience to paint in this style but it um it it, it is gorgeous and when i saw church's work i'm sorry go ahead joe oh no i didn't say Oh, okay. I thought I heard. So, um, yeah, when I saw churches, the the paintings um, that I'm that we're going to be going through, the particular one we're looking at right now is Autumn, um, and I think I have the wrong date on that, don't I? 
I don't think it was 17 or 1975. It was probably 1875. Oh. <laughs> so, well, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he he actually painted in from the grave. <laughs> so yeah, so 1875. Um, when I first saw this one, and the reason why I picked it was because it 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 more or less reminded me of John Constable, who lived in 1776 to 1837. So um, it was kind of, I guess it's an extension of that period, um, which what is, I guess the romantic, is it romantic, romanticism? Is that what they're? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah. So, but yeah, I did see a lot of constable in this one. So. Right. And obviously church was influenced by uh, Cole, church's uh, teacher, painted in Europe quite a bit. I think he studied in Europe too. Okay. And obviously he must've seen constable paintings there. And Church probably did at some point in his career too, because he traveled to Europe. Like almost all the American Hudson River School painters at some point studied in Europe. A lot of them in Dusseldorf, Germany, which had a, uh, a very strong uh, landscape tradition. Right. So is there anything specific you want to say about uh, autumn 1875? Um, I'm going to flip it to the next painting. Yeah, uh, no, I say let's bring on the next. I, I guess one thing that I do want to say is just he does, uh, you were talking about atmosphere and mm -hmm. Church does an amazing job of creating that depth, that sense of depth in that painting. You go right into that distant waterfall in the background. Yes. And even off into the sky and the hazy sun, but beyond it. Yeah. And they always seem to follow the same thing. I mean, the way that you basically meander back to that waterfall is that bright, brilliant orange vine that's climbing up the tree kind of catches your eye right and then you know you, you just go back further in, in into the painting nothing really to stop you from doing that no no and, it's and, a nice very, very sort of a gentle zigzag back and forth from that i start on that foreground rock in the right and then i go to the tree right and then to the waterfall and up to the sun yeah yeah so it's um yeah you, right you can start with the rock but i usually read left to right so <laughs> i end up being the author side of me ends up just jumping in on the left side of everything unfortunately but but even if you just go right to that vine you miss some of that gorgeous work done in the foreground there on the left as well where they have the tree stumps and there are two trees and um some light uh, like ochre color in the in the leaves so yeah brilliant brilliantly done so yeah um Okay, so um, the next one, I'm going to start with this, Joe, and um, John Ruskin, a modern painter, um, basically, I'm going to, I'm going to read a quote <laughs> that he had said, um, and he, and Ruskin himself emphasizes the close observation of nature, and then here's a quote from him, the imperative duty of the landscape painter is to descend to the lowest details with undiminished attention. Every class of rock, every kind of earth, every form of cloud must be studied with equal industry and rendered with equal precision. And that's the end of the quote. So I assume you agree with that? Um, not always, but sometimes. I don't render, personally, I don't render as tightly as Church did. I'll talk about that later on. Right. But at that time, the interesting thing about Church was he was, quite interested in science and the natural sciences. He was almost like a naturalist. Mm -hmm. And he was um, he uh, was a big fan of Alexander von Humboldt, who was a, one of the early naturalists. Um, and so a lot of science, uh, Church's paintings, it's almost like they're a scientific investigation. It's like, oh, and I, th this is the painting that sort of came up, came about, but I was really interested in the flora and the fauna of, this, of the tropics. And also he was quite interested in climatology. And here you have these different strata of climate going up from the tropical in the foreground to the uh, winter scene at the top of the mountain. So he was really quite interested in climatology and botany and geology. And as I said, it was almost like the painting was sort of an afterthought or just sort of a, something that resulted from his investigations in, into the uh, natural sciences. Wow. So this is the one that you were you referenced before. We have a picture of a Cotopaxi. Is that pronounced correctly? Right. No, actually, the one I was thinking of is a sunset. Oh, with a okay. Volcano exploding with this amazing plume of smoke and the sun behind this plume of smoke. Oh. But that, which is also Cotopaxi with the lake that wasn't there. 
Yeah, well, you kept the lake there. So yeah. <laughs> it is there. So this this too is, is um, just as wonderfully done. Um, I, I would imagine the one that with the volcano exploding probably had some really interesting atmospheric effects that this one doesn't have because it's just got a little plume up there at the top, but um, not like it's exploding or whatever. But um, right. yeah, so what I always find interesting too is um, up on the plateau before the volcano, um, let's see if my, yeah, there is cursor works there. He's got little people here. Which, yeah, it's a little village. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> my eye just caught that. I mean, can't tell you how many times I've looked at this. And then there's this beautiful lady sitting down here in the corner. So scale, I mean, I don't, I don't know what we're talking about is the size of the actual canvas itself for this particular one. And I don't expect you to know that either. But I mean, scale naturally is something that is very important for these paintings, for them to be so successful. Right. Uh, this um, is, I'm, I'm not sure of the exact size. I'm sure it's fairly large. Mm -hmm. And his, his uh, major painting, Heart of the Andes, which is at the Metropolitan Museum. And it's extreme, it's huge. I can't remember the name of that. It's probably like six by eight feet or even bigger, maybe. Yeah. And the interesting thing is when they exhibit, that went on tour. And you would pay, I think, like a nickel or something like that to go in and sit in a room. And they set the painting up and they had tropical plants on either side of the painting. So you were almost totally immersed in this subtropical um, landscape. And the amazing thing was back then, it was very difficult to travel to South America and through the jungle and go to these exotic places that he painted. Right. It's almost like going to the moon today. <laughs> so it was... Um, you know, quite an ordeal. He'd have a big uh, entourage of, I don't know, maybe 30 people with him, porters and, you know, cooks and people who'd set up the tents and and such. It was, so it was, it was quite an, an undertaking. And if you were, you know, you a farmer in upstate New York and you came down to the city and you saw Church's painting of the Andes of South America in this room, it would be an amazing experience because you'd never seen anything like that. They didn't have color um, printing, so you'd have to see the actual painting to appreciate the color. And mm -hmm. uh, most people had no idea what a palm tree was back then. Most people in New England. So to see this was really an amazing thing for most of the people, yeah. that, uh, and you know that were viewing it because they, it would, as I said, it'd be like us seeing when we see pictures of the moon. We've never been there to see it's really this exotic and um, magical place that we've only heard about. And, and I guess that would make, a, I mean, obviously makes a big difference to people when they, when they would be that immersed into this painting of, of a place like you said they haven't seen. But I also find it interesting because one of the things that I found when I was doing research on church was that they were saying, you know, his, his paintings were widely praised in the 1850s and the 1860s. And then they kind of dropped off and, I, and I'm like sitting in 2021 right now, looking at this painting in awe of his talents. And I mean, just look at the different colors of green that are <laughs> in this painting and um, the realness of it. And, and I, I, I don't know, I, I guess I always find it interesting that a particular style of any art tends to be like labeled passe or something. It's like, to me, something like this would never be passe. I mean, there's so much you can learn from this, even if I, and I paint more in an impressionist style, but I still find this wonderful to look at. And I know I can learn a lot <laughs> by studying him. So, you know, I, I don't, I, it's just, I don't know, maybe it's a pet peeve I have or something where you say that they've been praised for 10 years and then it fell out of fashion. Well, I think that a lot of that is manufactured too. I think that the average person will always appreciate ch church's work. Mm -hmm. It's sort of the, you know, the trendsetters or whatever that decide that, oh, it's time to move on to something different. But if you put churches, say, you know, in 18, the 1860s, when this was going on tour, if you sent it out again in the 1880s, when, you know, the, it was more of a, the tonalism was more popular and impressionism and such, it would still be incredibly popular with, the average person out there, but just sort of the, um, I, I guess, you know, like 
the critics and, and such decide that, oh, it's time to do something else that's passe. And they always have to keep the ball rolling and stuff. But I think realism will always have an appeal and will always be in vogue among, you know, most of the people. I think it's really just sort of the critics that decide what they just, you know, what's passe and what's not. And a lot of times what they like isn't what most people like. Yep. <laughs> Bananas taped to canvases. <laughs> right. I mean, silly things like that. It's like, what? <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to listen painting. to you about church? No, I don't think so. <laughs> well, if you have a banana taped to a, to a wall or you have a church painting and you ask most of the people out there which they would prefer hanging on their wall, I would guarantee you that the church painting would, would be the winner of that little contest. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree with that. I hope that uh, the rest of the world would also <laughs> agree with that too. But it's, you know, some of that stuff is just so silly. It's embarrassing yes. being an artist sometimes it is. and being yes, associated sometimes. with that because they're doing something completely different than what we're doing exactly. as realists. I mean, there's, there is virtually no crossover whatsoever. Yeah. The only minor crossover might, might be that we're communicating something to someone else visually. But even a lot of the contemporary artists, there's so little visual content that most of it is, you know, relies on what's been written about it. Yeah, exactly. So I know that was, I, I probably shouldn't have brought that up because I, I know how you feel go about on and on. I know, I'm sorry. I apologize. I probably- and I, I don't want to denigrate all contemporary abstract no, or there are some conceptual work because a lot of it's fascinating and really interesting. Mm -hmm. It's just different from what I'm doing. A lot of it is silly and nonsense, but there's a lot of silly and nonsense work being done in realism too. Yeah. yeah. But um, and, and as I said, I, I think some of it's really fascinating. Yes. But yeah. Most of it, I just, and but I, I can I appreciate it as a different art completely than from what I'm doing. Yes. You know, yes. it's like, I like to eat good food, but I know nothing about cooking and I don't really have appreciation for the art of cooking, but I like to eat good food. And it's the same with the different art forms. I like, I like them and I appreciate them, but I'm not really going to delve into them very deeply right. because it's just not what I'm really into. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody has, I mean, that's the wonderful part of the world is our differences that, and things that we like. And that can include art and music and food and just about everything, the clothes we wear, right. you know, the I animals say, we love, <laughs> so on. So I um, always say if we all painted the same way, it'd be a really boring art world. So I really like, yes. you know, diversity in the art world. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's cool. So this is um, one of church's last one, Valley of Santa uh, Isabel. I'm, I'm assuming that's pronounced Isabel. So, and it's from 1875, and this has a wonderful layer of atmosphere <laughs> to it. So if we want to start touching a little bit on, um, and then this will be a little bit hard for the podcast listeners because they're not actually looking at this, this painting, which is gorgeous. Um, but just talk a little bit about how the technique is that possibly church used or that you use if you're more comfortable talking about the technique you use to to layer in some atmosphere and we'll touch on it again as we get into the other three yeah. masters that we're going to talk about as well so yeah. uh, well I think the first thing about atmosphere people realize is dark things get lighter when they go off in the distance for instance you if you have a tree and it's sort of a dark olive green and that tree's five miles away or ten miles away it's going to lose its greenness and it's going to lose the depth of its value. So generally speaking, I think of it as yellow disappearing as things go into the distance. Because for instance, if you have a, a green tree, green is made up of yellow and blue. As that moves into the distance, rather than thinking of adding blue, I think of it as taking away the yellow. Because when colors, if, say you have like 10 different colored blocks and they all move back in space, the color that's going to turn grayish, grayish and lose its punch first is going to be yellow. So that happens with a hillside full of trees. As that moves into the distance, the yellow disappears, but the blue is retained. They used to paint fire trucks. Well, they paint fire trucks red. And now it's, oftentimes they'll paint them yellow, that bright yellowy green because they realize that it doesn't matter if you can see the fire truck from a mile away because if it's red, you can. If it's yellow, you can't see it very well a mile away because the yellow is going to look sort of grayish. You want to see a fire truck when it's like 100 feet away or 200 feet away. 
and that yellow just screams at you at that at that close distance. So up close, yellow is very bright, but in the distance, it's very muted. Uh, red retains its redness. So if you have a red fire truck that's two miles away, that's going to still look fairly red. And if it's up close, obviously it's still going to be red, but red retains its redness in the distance. Yellow loses its yellowness as it goes off into the distance. If I can, it's sort of a convoluted way of explaining that. Yeah, so, go ahead. So when I'm painting a landscape and I'm moving into the distance, I'm thinking of taking out the yellow and the blue will, will remain. Um, so generally speaking, things appear bluer as they move into the distance because you've lost the yellow. And they'll appear cooler too as it moves into the distance because the blue and the pur purples will start to predominate. Now a light color, however, is gonna do something a little bit different. If you have white and that moves into the distance, it's gonna get warmer and sort of um, a little bit redder. For instance, if you think of a thunderhead that's a several miles, you know, 20 miles away or 30 miles away, it has that sort of pink color to it. Uh -huh. It's not pure white and it's not light blue because white light colors get warmer and darker as they move into the distance. Whereas dark colors like the tree get cooler and lighter as they move into the distance. I had a problem with that years ago and I was painting a beach. It was sort of a sandy, warm, sandy color up close. And I thought, oh, well, things get lighter and bluer as they move into the distance. So I painted the beach lighter and bluer as it moved off into the distance. And it got, it turned this sort of pasty white color. And I couldn't understand why it didn't look right. <laughs> and then after some investigation, I realized that, oh, actually, light colors don't get lighter and bluer like dark colors do. They get warmer and darker. Huh. Okay. So I'm looking at this painting and in the foreground, I see some lovely more to the yellow side greens on the, right. on the ground. Yep. And um, even the trees, except for their shadow areas, but still even yep. then they're warmer in temperature yep. and, and yellower. Mm -hmm. And then we move back and I see the sun there. And that's where you're talking about, you know, the yellowness and maybe it's my monitor which it possibly could be that maybe it isn't as yellow where you're seeing it, but yeah. I'm talking about like, just like this area here, which is the atmosphere, yeah. if the right. air, if you will, looks very yellow to me. This looks more purple. The mountains, I'm pointing to the mountains now on in this, you know, there's some purple in here, which is yeah. your bluer. Yeah. And you said red. So does it, I guess like, the question I'm getting to is, I had a long conversation with Carolyn Anderson about um, the wavelengths of the colors with blue being a longer wavelength than we probably actually give it credit for and yellow being a shorter wavelength. So it kind of goes into that whole conversation about the color waves, the wavelengths of the colors themselves. Yeah, and... <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, well, I got like 20 different conversations going on in my head with this. So <laughs> sorry about that. But but yeah, I guess that that was the main thing was it's just like, you know, the the um it's staying bluer in the distance but lighter in value. Right. Okay. And that, and you're talking about basically the plane of 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 like if I think about John Carlson's landscape guide and he talks about the four different planes, the sky being the lightest, the ground being the next lightest, and then the, the angular curve of value that of like a slanted curve or slanted plane. Yeah. And, and a flat plane. And a vertical. Yeah. Yeah. So, so all of that, you, you have to basically get all of that pulled together to really start understanding atmosphere, right? Right. And if you look at Church's painting, the distant mountain where it's the deepest blue is like right by that palm tree. And that's because that's almost a vertical plane. But if you look at the left side where the sunlight is sort of permeating the mountain a little bit more, you can see it's much lighter because it's that warm atmosphere is starting to affect the color of the mountain. So there's actually, you can simplify it, but there are all these little modifiers in there. For instance, in the distance, right under the sun, the atmosphere is permeated by all the, the, the sunlight, or the sunlight is permeating the atmosphere. 
which in the sunlight is warm. Mm -hmm. So that's making that section of the painting a little bit warmer, but it's still lighter and um, paler than the foreground. But on the left side, it's darker and bluer because the sunlight isn't permeated that part. It's, um, it's in shadow. Right. So you have a, a couple of different phenomena going on in this painting. You have the sunlight permeating the atmosphere and you have the atmosphere where there isn't as strong a sunlight, like on the right side of that mountain in the distance where it's bluer. Mm -hmm. Right there, the sunlight isn't affecting it as much as it is on the left side right below the sun because the sun is just above your pointer right now behind yeah. that heat. Yeah, right here. Yeah. Yeah. So the sunlight is um, all the little particles of dust and gas and such. The sunlight is picking, is reflecting off of them. On the left side, it's further from the sun, so there's not quite as much of the dust and the gas being picking up the um, particles of the sunlight. Yeah. See, and this is where science comes into art. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, so we're well, going to move. In landscapes, <laughs> you're, you're right. You're, you're, when you paint landscapes, you're a little bit of a geologist and botanist and a um, topographer and an architect and a a yacht designer, <laughs> all these different things go into it because you're, you know, trying to depict these different features in the landscape. Right. And, and I think it's the more you understand about those things. Yeah. <laughs> the more you understand about you know, all of those things and how it affects or affects um, nature and what we're seeing is so important to how we interpret and then how we represent that in our paintings. So, yeah. all right, so we're gonna move on from church and we're going to move to someone who's new to me. I don't think I've ever saw any Sanford Gifford paintings before or actually um, heard his name. So this was a great discovery for me. Um, he was born in 1823 and he died in 1880. Um, Sanford. Robinson Gifford. I could never just find anybody saying Stanford Gifford. It had to be Stanford Robertson Gifford. Um, so he's a landscape painter. He's one of the leading members of the Hudson River School, which like totally blew me away because I was like, why didn't I hear this person? And um, he has an emphasis on light and soft atmospheric effect and uh, it was regarded as a partic uh, practitioner of luminism, which Joe will tell us what luminism is. So go ahead, Joe, talk a little bit about Sanford Gifford, because I really couldn't find a, a whole lot on him, except for what I just basically said, and maybe two more paragraphs. So. <laughs> oh, he's uh, one of my favorite landscape painters, and largely because he is, conveys the sense of space and atmosphere so beautifully. Um, he was in the Civil War. He did some Civil War um, battle scenes and camp, a lot of camp scenes and such too. And he was the second, what they call the second generation Hudson River School. Um, he was a little bit younger and came a little bit after uh, Thomas Cole and Frederick Church and I think Bierstadt too even. Hmm. But uh, he was also, more importantly for me, he was um, one of the luminists. Mm -hmm. And the luminists, there wasn't a really well-defined group. In fact, they didn't even call this group of artists luminous until the 1940s, when our historians looked at their work and said, no, there's an underlying theme that seems to tie these painters together. And the theme was that they had this spiritual component in their paintings that when you look at a lot of them, it sort of creeps in, as Andrew Wyeth would say, it creeps in through the back door. And you say, you know, there's something really similar about the philosophy in these painters and their resulting paintings. And the Luminists were influenced by the Transcendentalists, as I was mentioned before, Emerson and Thoreau and Fuller were like probably the three um, most uh, important Transcendentalists. The Transcendentalists were, uh, they were set, centered around Concord Mass, which is how I came to know them fairly well. And they had this idea that um, you could experience the sublime and you could experience spirituality through, through, through nature and through the landscape. And they thought that light, particularly light, was an important signifier of that. And they had a whole range of philosophy where um, you know, they believed in self-reliance and that you didn't necessarily have to go to a church to experience God and spirituality, you could do it in nature. 
is nature was sort of God's handiwork. Um, and they thought that nature was sort of a portal to the sublime. So uh, I, I, I'm somewhat receptive to that idea. Um, I think there is a spiritual component to our existence. I'm not exactly sure what it is, and it may be a little bit of everything, it, it's, but I'm, I'm convinced it's there. And I think that it's a, an actual existing thing, just like the landscape exists. And so I think they go hand in hand as a, a connection between the spiritual component of our existence and the landscape and the, the world as we experience it. And the interesting thing is that, you know, there's so many possibilities out there. Um, I mentioned before that there's this idea that I have about a fish in a pond where you have a pond and there's a fish and the fish is the smartest fish in that pond. But th th that fish doesn't realize that a mile away there's a road and that road takes people and cars to cities. And in cities there are, you know, there's art museums and there are airports and you can fly to different parts of the world. And that's how we as humans are. We experience our our ponds, you know, the, the universe as far as we can see it, but we have no idea what exists outside of this pond. And it could be, and I, I'm convinced it's something, you know, amazing and beautiful and, and such, and that's that we're part of it and our world is part of it. And we also just happen to live in the most beautiful planet. You know, I'll <laughs> go outside and I say that all the time and say, you know, like Saturn and Mars and the moon, all these other planets and satellites are interesting, but they're just not as beautiful as our planet is. And to me, that's an amazing thing too. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why I paint landscapes because um, if I was just painting like pretty pictures, I think I've gotten bored a long time ago, but being able to experience the spirituality along with the physics, the actual mechanics of how our world works and how our, you know, how the landscape is put together sort of in a, an obvious upfront um, aspect, but also like, you know, how, how does physics work? Mm -hmm. That really is interesting to me too. And I think it all comes together and uh, through painting the landscape, I can sort of explore that and contemplate it and think about it and express it. Um, and that's one of the reasons also why a lot of my paintings are not little depictions of what I'm seeing, but they're compilations of things I've experienced over the years because um, I don't want to just be sort of a recorder of things. I want to be a, I want to ha I have it. Usually I have an idea first and then I figure out how to express it with paint, I guess is what I'm saying, rather than seeing a scene and painting that and painting exactly as I see it. Now, sometimes that does happen. And in my sketches, I try to be really accurate with my sketches because that's my, those are my notes. And it would be like if you were a doctor seeing a patient and you were taking sloppy notes. Um, you probably wouldn't have a very good outcome, but if you are a doctor and you take really good notes, when you're able to diagnose and treat that patient, you'll probably have a good outcome. And it's the same when I'm a uh, plein air painting, they're my notes. And if I take good notes, I'll be able to use them and, and interpret them back into the studio into something different rather than just a literal transcription of what I'm doing. Yeah. Which is why I have that site size viewfinder that, um, I've, I've made it this viewfinder that I actually sell on my website. And what it does, it allows me to paint really quickly and really, really accurately when I'm in the landscape. Because painting quickly and accurately is important because the light's changing the whole time when we're out there and the weather's changing and the tide's coming in and going out. So the scene that you start at the beginning of your painting, it, it usually takes me maybe around three hours to do a, a midday painting. Uh, sunsets have to be quicker, obviously. Right. But the scene that you start with at sunset or midday isn't the same scene that you finish because everything is moving, everything is changing, the light's changing, the tide's coming and going, the uh, wind is changing, you have these beautiful reflections and an hour later the wind comes up and your reflections are all gone. The boat you're painting sails away and the, you know, so you have to paint quickly and accurately and the viewfinder helps me to do it. What it is is just a frame that I look through and everything I see in the frame I transpose onto my uh, plein air panel and it makes the drawing go much uh, quicker and much more accurately. Yeah. Um, thank you for mentioning that. I actually, I need to, to get one of those, <laughs> but I haven't been out plein air painting and you actually stepped right into one of the things that I wanted to talk about, 
Um, and and it, one of the things that I did find on Gifford was his method of creating works of art. And it was to sketch rough, small works first in oil paints from and in his sketchbook, basically. And then um, actually, I did that wrong. I said that wrong. He would sketch in pencil in his sketchbook. Then he would create a small plain air, not plain air, but in his studio, a rough, small work in oil, and then transfer that to a larger, um, the small into a finished larger painting uh, later. At least that's what they had written down, according to my notes. Yeah, he did do a lot of plain air painting in location too. Though. Did he? Okay. Yeah. They, they didn't mention that. So I guess it, it, but he did I, a lot of drawing too. So yeah. it's, they're both I right. I think you have to, but um, I mean, when I, when I, I was kind of taught in the plain air method um, from Kevin and Joanna Arnett, Kevin McPherson, Joanna Arnett uh, went to, to New Zealand and saw Ben Ho down in New Zealand. Ben is a wonderful artist trained in China and then moved to New Zealand. Um, if you've not seen his work, Joe, look him up on the website. It's, he, it's wonderful. And um, actually I learned a lot from Ben just watching him paint. And he was done in 45 minutes and his, his canvas size was probably about a 16 by 20. Yeah, that's and, big rock size. Yes, it is. And I was just amazed, like here I am with a little, you know, nine by 12 and I'm struggling <laughs> and he's got a 16 by 20 and he's done in 45 minutes. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> how did he do that? But there's this whole, I just want to get your opinion on this. We're not going to go into something real deep, but you know, there's a, there's always the argument out there that plain air painting is 100% plain air painting. You have to have it finished when you walk away from when you're in the field and you're not allowed to touch it up or it's not considered plain air. If you can't touch it up in the studio because it's not considered plain air if you do that. I mean, there's that hardcore group that says that. There's also a group that goes out, paints, paints plain air, brings it back to the studio, studies it, finds mistakes and maybe corrects it. Because, I mean, I find it hard not to make mistakes in plain air because everything's moving so fast, but you know, then they'll correct it. And they, so you have a group saying, yes, that's still plain air because I did the majority of it outside. I personally say, why are you even arguing about this? <laughs> it's one of the things that I say, um, because like I said, I find it hard not to make mistakes because I'm looking up from my painting it is 10 minutes later and the lights changed. So most, most folks that I know usually start out with some kind of sketch capturing where the values are so that when they look up, they may be taking reference of colors that are in front of them, but they're probably following a sketch or something in their mind so that they're not making the mistake of how light travels, how, how the atmospheric effects change from minute to minute, even quicker than that sometimes. So, so what do you think? Is it plain air uh, if it's only done hundred percent out in the open or is it, or can you make well, changes? <laughs> I would say it's plain air if you don't, if all you do is use what you saw and then you, um, you can clean it up back at the studio. For instance, when I paint, I clamp my um, panel to my easel with a clamp. And there's always a little square at the top that I've got to touch up when I get back to the studio. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if you use a photograph when you come into the field, then it's not plein air because a right. photograph just has so much information there. And it's kind of the antithesis of plein air. I mean, it, it really doesn't have, it's, it's a completely different experience painting from a photograph or painting from nature. The photograph is static. All the work is done for you. Basically the drawing's done. The colors are already chosen. So when you take out a photograph, you're sort of negating the experience of plein air painting. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about plein air painting is it's like you're painting segments of time. Right. Because you started at one o'clock and this is where the sun was. And then by three o'clock or four o'clock, the sun's in a completely different position. So you're kind of painting a period of time rather than an instantaneous view where a photograph is an instantaneous click, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that's 
um, I think there's a huge difference then. So if you're if you're painting in, in nature and then say it's three o'clock and things have changed and you're still painting, what's the difference whether you're sitting in the field or you're sitting back at the studio? You know, you're not looking at your subject anymore, really, because everything has changed so much and you're just finishing up in this in the field. I don't think there's anything wrong with getting as far as you can in the field, then bring it back to the studio and neatening it up and cleaning it up in the studio because you're still using the information and the memory that you have from when you were in the field. And right. for me, the most important thing about being about plein air painting isn't the painting, it's the experience and the things I've learned and the things I've struggled with. The, the magic of it is you have to figure out every aspect of that painting on your own and you have to figure out how to render it. Mm -hmm. With a photograph, that's already kind of done for you. You already have mm -hmm. everything there. You can interpret the photo if you want. But with nature, you've got to investigate it, look at it, determine all these um, different things like the color, the shape, the texture, the value, and then and recreate that on your panel. And so when you finish, it's you have that imprinted on your, your mind really well. It's like they say, if you... If someone tells you the definition of a word, you remember for like 10 minutes. If you look it up in a dictionary, you'll remember it forever. Right. And it's kind of the same thing with plein air painting. If you have to figure out on the spot how to put that tree together and how the branches go and what color they are, you're going to remember that much more vividly and thoroughly than you would if you took a photograph and you copied the shapes that you see. Because a photograph is flat. All you're doing is copying shapes and colors and values. Right. A tree is three dimension. You're not copying anything. You're creating something because when you look at a tree, it's in three dimensions. It's blowing in the wind. It's a, you know, a living thing. Mm -hmm. Where a photograph is you're basically taking a flat object and making another flat object out of it. Right. A dead flat object. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and that it's, it's really been kind of interesting because with moving to Asheville from Ohio, you know, I have all of this wonderful atmosphere that I now have to study and look at and, and determine how to paint. And, um, you know, I have mountains and I have rivers in front of the mountains and I've got a whole different set of flana, fauna and flora that, that I need to look at and, and determine how light hits that now. And, you know, so that, I mean, I could just go out and study for hours and putting this information in my head and, I like to use what I call imagination when I come back and paint in my studio of what I've seen. It's like, oh yeah, I saw that. I'm going to put that in here and, and really work it out. Um, but I'm not plain air painting. I mean, I'm not standing outside in the plain air painting. <laughs> I'm in my studio recalling what I saw. Right. And, you know, I might go back to that same spot and, and study it, uh, sketch it, whatever. Um, but I'm not taking my whole, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not going to hike up three miles with, with all my plein air painting gear to do that. So, um, yeah, so it, it, it was an interesting discussion. I've seen it pop up, I don't know how many times now on different social media platforms and, and things like that. And, and honestly, I just kind of get a kick out of all of the conversation and argument that goes back and forth and find it kind of comic, but that's me. Um, yeah. I, I tend to to think about it the way you do, Joe. So, um, yeah, I, I want to experience that that moment in nature and take in as much as I can uh, without worrying about, am I the right value on my paint right there <laughs> at that particular time? Yeah. I may get out and plein air paint again, but when you're beginning to paint, I think plein air painting is the hardest thing to study, it's, to it start out with. Uh, the, there's nothing harder in the art world than plein air painting. Yes. Because number one, you've got to lug your studio out into the field. You've got to find a subject somewhere. You can't rearrange the vase or the figure or, or such. So you have to find a ready-made subject and composition that works fairly well. Uh, you have the time issue, as we were saying, the lights changing. So you're, it's a, a moving target. And there's just an incredible amount of objects and textures and things to paint up there. If you look at Gifford's painting here, mm -hmm. you know, there's trees with thousands of millions of leaves there. How do you interpret all those leaves? There's a river and there's cows that are moving around there. There's weather that's changing. It's, you know, it's a continual challenge. And then just the physical challenges, it's hot and you've got your water 
and the flies are driving you crazy or it's cold and your fingers are getting cold and you've got to walk you know two miles back to your car or um it it's windy raining or and snowing your or it starts <laughs> raining or people come up and start they want to have a chat <laughs> and, um <laughs> So it's, you know, it's an incredibly difficult subject. And also the it light, is. the most important yes. thing and the most difficult thing to overcome is the light. When you're plein air painting, if the light's on your panel, it's going to look different than when you light your panels in shade. Mm -hmm. And if you're painting objects in the shade or objects in the sun, they're going to be much differently handled. Where studio painters, if you have a figure, you can paint exactly what you see in the colors and the values exactly as you see, because the light on the figure is the same as the light on your your canvas yep. still life but in the field if you're painting into the sunlight your canvas is really dark in comparison mm -hmm. even when you start off with a white canvas if you hold it up against the sky it's already darker than the sky mm -hmm. so how do you paint that sky you can't match the color because your canvas is already darker because it's in shade conversely if you turn your canvas around so the sunlight's on your canvas now you can't paint the shadow areas dark enough because your sunlight's in can and your canvas is in sunlight but the objects that you're painting are in shade and you can't make them darker. Then so have, we don't have the range of value that you find in nature right. when you're outdoors. Indoors you can, indoors you can match the values exactly yeah. because you're painting in a subdued light. But outdoors, the sun is so strong that you can't match the colors exactly. So you're always interpreting and mm -hmm. you're always estimating. Everything's sort of an estimate and um, you're doing sort of a, um, you're figuring out ways to interpret, to indicate different things without actually painting it exactly as you see it right you also have to be aware of what colors you're wearing and how that influences your yeah. canvas too because it yeah, does reflect suddenly <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so you asked me to put this particular one in was there something that you wanted to talk about the passing storm and the andorondics uh or yeah this this is i think probably the first gifford painting i saw and i was just totally amazed by it it's at the uh, after the, at the name. And it's uh, just a, a beautifully atmospheric painting. You can hear the thunder coming. Um, and the wonderful thing about Gifford and the um, Luminous is the thing that tied them together, together was their philosophy. And a lot of times I'll see paint, uh, painters call themselves Luminous because they'll paint a sunset from a photograph or something. Mm -hmm. And you can't paint a luminous painting from a photograph because the photograph doesn't have that spirituality that you find in nature. A photograph mm -hmm. is, you know, if you print it out, it's a piece of paper. If you look at it on your screen, it's pixels. But paper and pixels don't have a spiritual component to them. There's no spirituality there. So you have to paint. If you're a luminous, you have to paint from nature. And that's what uh, Gifford and the other luminous did is their, their studio was outdoors. And then they would translate that experience into these, you know, the, the finished works of art. But I think for them, the most important and beautiful part of their artwork is what were they, they what they were doing outdoors and what they experienced out there. And it was really unlike any other period in, in art before then, because uh, there were some artists like Const Constable, for instance, that painted outdoors and artists who do a little bit of sketching outdoors and such. But the Luminists and the Hudson River School painters were really the first ones that a significant part of their artwork required them to be out of doors, right. living in nature, experiencing. I mean, they were camping and, and such. They go to New Hampshire and like basically camp out for the summer. Right. Yeah, that's. Um, we have one more painting to look at from Sanford Gifford, but thank you for introducing me to him because I've love this painting <laughs> and of course i'll you never be some. able to afford it but <laughs> <laughs> but it is it is um wonderful it's uh, you know it, it, the the difference between the the light hitting the shadow hitting these trees and the light hitting these and of course if you look above that shadow there's the cloud um you know and then the, this light area here it's just it's a i i don't know how long it took him to paint this but it is gorgeous I just I never would have found this person on my own, I don't think. So thank you for doing that. And um, let's go to the next. So this is the Mount Mansfield, and this is um, 1858. And I 
picked this one, not realizing that there was a controversy about it. I don't know if you knew about that. No. Okay. <laughs> and it had absolutely nothing to do with him as a painter. It had to do with a museum selling this painting so that it could meet its debts. Uh. So, so that's why I didn't make a big deal about talking about it or anything. It wasn't anything about the actual painter itself. It was about the museum selling it so that it could pay off some debts. And I was like, what's that have to do with the artist? But anyway, especially since it happened after um, Sanford was, was no longer living. But this particular one reminded me of one that I have later on in the show of your Western um, paintings that you did with the, the people and um, the black hat, for example, was, is the one that I'm kind of referring to. Um, so, yeah, so this, this was, and again, you know, great atmosphere here. Um, the redness, the reddish tint here, uh, on the land itself. And then going into the, the yellow above, you see, uh, um, above that, you, there are some clouds that are kind of, I would say, um, yellow with a bit of green in it um and some purple shading over on to that that reflective light the red light from below reflecting up into that so yeah so any comment on this particular painting joe um, it's a yeah as you were saying it's a beautiful interpretation of light and atmosphere mm. um and he, he does that by modifying the color and the value as it moves off into space. And once again, you can see the yellow in those trees in the right foreground and how it disappears as it moves off into space. Oh yeah. And where it's late in the day, the, it's sort of a purpley pinkish color where the light is sort of permeating the atmosphere in the distance there. Mm -hmm. um, and I love the figures because they're doing the same thing we are. They're admiring this beautiful sunset. And you can see that guy just standing there saying, God, that's beautiful. Yep. Um, and he also further and create recreates the sensation of space and, and depth and distance by having those dark shadows and the rocks in the foreground and the left there. Yeah. Right in here. So sometimes when you um you add these elements that you know the rocks may may, may or may not have been there, but he obviously put them there to create that contrast between the foreground in the background because mm -hmm. if you envision the painting without those rocks it would be sort of pale and and milky and just not really very dramatic or um it wouldn't convey that sense of deep deep space right. so that's a compositional thing that he he chose to include and he has a beautiful sort of u-shaped composition to you i sort of goes down the rocks at the left mm -hmm. and around and up that ridge to the right yep and then it's sort of you lead back into the where the sunspot is in that lake in the way off in the distance. Right. Then you also have these that help you kind of march down a little bit. You have the fence posts or dead trees, trunks, trees, whichever, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> whichever you want to call them. Yeah. And, and the little trees make you stop. What I really love about this is the two people are kind of looking out to the left, but you have the dog is kind of being the dog, right? Yeah. yeah, whatever. Let's go. I want to start walking. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think a dog, I don't know, does a dog appreciate a sunset? Yeah. No, I probably appreciate would, yeah. sitting next to you. And if you have any crackers or cheese, it would appreciate you even more, yeah. maybe. <laughs> so, so yeah. So wonderful painting again. Um, and the atmosphere in, in this particular one. And I guess I, you know, like I said, a lot of folks, um, we're talking to me, it's like, you know, I, I really can't get that elusive uh, atmosphere, but, but if you go back and you study the luminous and, and um, well, it, Frank Benson, who we, or I think it's Frank, isn't it? Benson? Yeah. Yeah, Frank yeah. Um, Benson and, and the Hudson River School, they have a lot of atmosphere in their work. So mm -hmm. studying them um, actually would be a very good way to start to understand and, and when I say study them, it's, it's like, I really mean study them, not copy them. <laughs> Although trying to copy them will help you learn as well. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, you, it is about understanding nature, understanding science, what's going on with light in, in that particular area. So let's um, pop over to and start talking about um, Andrew Wythe. And everybody knows well, everybody who's in art knows Andrew White, let's put it that way. Um, he was born in 1917. He passed in 2009. So almost a contemporary, almost. So, um, 
a visual artist, primarily a realist painter, working predominantly in the what they called online regional list style. So, um, and that is defined as American realist movement. It was basically modern art that included paintings, murals, lithographs, illustration depicting realistic scenes of rural and small town America. It primarily of the Midwest and it basically arose in the 1930s during the Great Depression and they said ended somewhere in the 1940s. I love when they do that. <laughs> the critics and, and people that, that write this. <laughs> we won't go there, that's one of my pet peeves. So, but this is actually, um, Andrew Wyeth was the son of N.C. Wyeth, and that's why I made the comment about you studying from your father, James, because Andrew Wyeth learned a lot from his father, and um, he was a draftsman before he could actually read. So, um, sorry, my phone is... I got people texting me. So, uh, yeah, so that, that it was kind of interesting to... Uh, check out about Andrew so that I could be prepared to talk to you about Andrew um, Wythe a little bit better. Uh, naturally, I've heard of him. Naturally, I've seen some of his work. Um, but the interesting things like um, the conversations that he had between his himself and his father uh, were really interesting to listen to. So did you did you become attracted to Andrew Wythe because of that father-son relationship and your father-son relationship, or was it just totally the art? It was, uh, it was just totally the art. Um, when I was, I think it was around 1968 or so, when I was around 10 or so, they had an exhibition of Andrew Wythe paintings at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And I went with my parents. And I don't really remember it all that well. I just remember going, but they bought the big Andrew Wythe book this is a really large um, Andrew Wyeth book that covers his work from like probably the 1930s up till like 1968 or so. And I spent hours and hours and hours throughout my lifetime looking at that book. It was an enormous influence on me when I was a kid. Um, and there again, almost like with the Hudson River painters, the first thing that attracted me was the realism he was able to capture. But it was also his the beauty and the the things that he found the simple things he found that were like really quite beautiful mm -hmm. and then as i got older i'd find different aspects of his paintings that i really appreciated um once i really started painting myself there was his textures that were amazing you look at a, a wall that he painted and especially if you see them in real life you, you don't realize how much texture and how he really throws the paint around on his paintings, and then he picks out little accents and little details that really sharpen everything up. Even the painting of the boat here, if you look at the grass, without mm -hmm. the boat there, the grass is just sort of this mush of texture and marks and such, and a couple of details here and there, but there's not a lot of rendering. Mm -hmm. And then he puts that nice crisp boat in there, and it bring, makes it appear that this is really tightly rendered painting. Mm -hmm. But if you look at each part individually, it's not very well, it's not very fussy. The rendering is not fussy, I guess is what I'm saying. And then he would pick out parts of the painting to be fussy about. But his you know, handling of the paint and interpretation of nature was, I thought was really beautiful. And I love his strong values too. If you look at the painting of the boat and the roof of the house and such, it really exists. Its, it's strength is, exists because of those strong values, that dark roof, which doesn't usually, you know, the, the buildings in the background and the trees and the right are in the background. Mm -hmm. And he has some of the darkest, values way way back there in space but by doing that it really sets off the landscape against the sky mm -hmm. um and the other thing i love about him is he started off very loose if you looked at the painting on the left camden hills maine it's a very loose watercolor mm -hmm. and then he became really tight with his watercolors relatively speaking there again as i'm saying he would when you look at them in close he's splattering and slopping and stuff but they have this really tight look to them where originally he was almost impressionistic and the other great thing about his, him is he doesn't do anything like his dad did. He became his own, his own man. And that, I think that was really admirable because his father was one of the most famous illustrators of the era. And it would be so easy to become sort of a clone of his father. And he would have had a ready-made career and such. But he went the opposite direction and did things completely different from his father. Yeah. There was a, um, I want to read this, this um, quote from N.C. Wyeth to Andrew in 1944. I just love this. 
the, the great men, Thoreau, Goethe, uh, Goethe, I guess, G-O-E-T-H-E, sorry. I'm not yeah, Goethe, thank you. I knew I was pronouncing yeah. it wrong, but it was just not going to come. <laughs> um, Emerson and Tolstoy forever radiate as a sharp sense of that profound requirement of an artist to fully understand that consequences of what he creates are unimportant. So again, it goes back to that, the voice, right? In, inserting your voice versus letting nature have its voice or, or letting the painting have its own voice. Um, so I, I love that quote. I thought it was really interesting. So. Um, the other thing I love about Andrew Wyeth is when I went to art school, almost all of the, it's, it's interesting because we got to art school because we could draw and we could paint basically. And mostly because we were able to draw well. And when I went to art school in the 1970s, you know, they're really pushing abstraction, modernism kind of. And there wasn't a lot of emphasis on, you know, drawing well, really. And it was, it was almost like the teachers thought they had to reprogram all of us in this, you know, they'd have to say, Jackson, Pollock, good, Andrew White, bad. <laughs> and none of the teachers liked Andrew White. Interesting. And, but, uh, you know, a lot of us artists loved Andrew White and the, the other, my classmates who could draw well, all loved Andrew White. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of, that was kind of one of the, the first initiations I had into these two, two art worlds, sort of the conceptual abstract and the representational. It's interesting that because Andrew Wyeth said that although he thought of, that he was thought of as a realist, he thought of himself as an abstractionist. So kind of interesting <laughs> when they're yeah. saying Andrew Wyeth bad, right? <laughs> yeah. And the other thing is like, you know, people pick out Andrew Wyeth as being overly sentimental, but when you realize what he was painting and you look at what his painting, wasn't a sentimental at all. For one thing, he was painting, you know, his own time. So in rural America. Right. And so that was the way it was. We look back on it now as being sentimental because, you know, everyone likes a little bit of nostalgia, but, you know, in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, it wasn't nostalgia, it was realism. And if you look at the paintings of Christina, you know, like Christina's world, you look at it as a beautiful girl in, the, in this field, but she was a cripple. She was sitting in the field because she had to drag herself up to the house that she, you know, lived in and was barely surviving, it seems like. And it, it isn't this sweet, you know, romantic painting. It's a, a woman who struggled all her life um, and had a very difficult life. Wow. I should have put that one in here. <laughs> so I could have been able to see it. So yeah, um, so interesting. So anything else that you wanted to touch on with, with Andrew Wyeth? I know that you went at Teal Island and we talked about that a little bit yeah. um, on here. So we move on to Frank Benson. Yeah. Okay. So I thought this was interesting, Joe, because other than figures, small figures, like in your large landscapes that you paint. I don't know if I've ever seen anything like the two, well, this is summer 1909, which I'm assuming is probably one of Frank Benson's, you know, very, very, very famous paintings. And then the other one of the daughters that you asked me to put in, which I'll flip to here in a few seconds. But let me, before I get into the question, let me just say that uh, Frank Benson was born in 1862. He passed in, 18, in 1951. He's known for realist portraits, portraits, American Impressionist paintings, watercolor, and etchings. Um, he went to the School of, of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, so um, very close to you. <laughs> and um, let's see if there's anything. He was deeply in, influenced by Vermeer and um, Diago Velasquez, I'm sorry, my pronunciations are bad. And, and when I first saw this summer 1909 painting, I, I um, immediately thought of Soroya. So, so kind of interesting. There's influences there I, that you can definitely see in his work in, in summer of 1909. So yeah, so what drove, what brought you to um, Frank Benson being one of your faves? Now he also, I guess, was in the Hudson River School as well. No, right? he was, no, no, he okay. was, he was, he was later. Oh, okay. Was, I'm uh, thinking the 10 American painting painters and yeah, um, he started the American Academy of Arts and the Guild of Boston artists. So, okay, go ahead. Um, what I love about Benson is he, I think he was maybe the best impressionist 
And he was able to convey the sense of light. And the issue the Impressionists had was that when they would paint outside, they had the sun shining on their painting. Mm -hmm. uh, they, even if it were in shade, it would still be light outside. So they'd have this painting look very colorful and lively. And then they would bring them into their um, dimly lit victories and they would die, that all the color would fade away and the values would hold up, but they, they just wouldn't have that life and the sensation of outdoor light mm -hmm. that they had when they painted out of doors. So the struggle that they had was how can we attain that sense of sunlight and brightness when you bring them indoors? And what they did is they substituted um, value for color. So they, they ramped up the color basically. But when you do that, you have to, um, you lose the value, for instance, um, if you have, say, blue, now a, a medium, um, say a medium like uh, cobalt blue is probably the most vibrant blue. Mm -hmm. When you make that blue darker, you're going to basically lose the punch of the blueness. It's going to start looking blacker and eventually it'll look black. And the same thing happens when you add white to make it lighter. Mm -hmm. You're going to lose the power. It's going to look baby blue, then powder blue, and then white. And baby blue isn't a very strong color color wise. So the Impressionists realized they had to keep their paintings much more colorful and more in the middle value range. And by doing that, they were able to retain the color when they brought them indoors. Now they realized that they would lose the value, but they would still have the color because you can't have strong color and strong value because in, in one color, should I say, because the strongest color is going to be the middle value range, even yellow. If you have like a, you know, a a, a cadmium yellow medium, which is probably the brightest yellow. Mm -hmm. You can't lighten or darken that without losing the power. It's going to get paler if you lighten it, and it's going to get more towards sort of a mustardy yellow if you as you deepen it. So the impressionist said we have to, for us, color is more important. But what I like about Benson is he was able to have retain the color, but also have a wonderful sense of value too in his paintings. He has these little dark accents in this painting. Mm -hmm. For instance, the bows in the hair and the, the dark hair and the girl in the left and the dark tree on the hillside and those little uh, blue trees in the distant island. Mm -hmm. So he found these little tricks and little ways to get little value accents too. And if you saw this in black and white, it would still probably hold up pretty well as a, as a, a as an image in black mm -hmm. and white with just the values. Where a lot of Impressionist paintings, they weren't able to do that. If you see them in black and white, they don't hold up. Um, the one that I use as an example oftentimes is Monet's Sunrise, the yes. one with the orange sun, which mm -hmm. was the name, which was the painting that um, earned, earned the Impressionist, the name Impressionism. And if you look at a black and white image of that, it all looks gray and middle-toned and you can't hardly see any composition. Every, it just looks like a gray, smeary painting. Yes. Where with Benson, he was able to figure out ways to combine value and color. Yeah. In this, you can just feel that sunlight and the breeze, and it's just a beautiful depiction of the atmosphere and also the composition and the shapes and such a beautiful too. Yeah, I usually, just like I do with Soroya, is like I always find like this one little thing, like this little blue right here on her cheekbone underneath to set off this, the, where the sun is coming through her hand because she has her hand over her forehead. Um, you have that, that play of that orange and blue compliment going on right there on the cheekbone. And you know, out, out of all of that, that's what draws my eye. Yeah, um, and that was, he, he was great at putting these complementary colors next to each other to make the colors vibrate a little bit more right. and get even a brighter sensation of color. Yeah, so this is this another gorgeous painting. I think I may have actually seen this in a um, in a they had the American Impressionist versus like the French Impressionist uh, exhibition up in Columbus, and I think one of his paintings was in there. I don't know if he ever traveled to Germany or not, but I know that Monet had a, a big influence on him. But yeah. Um, yeah, so it was really interesting to see his work, you know, hanging next to to Monet's work as well. So. I'm going to flip to the uh, portraits of my daughter, 1908. I think this was the one that you asked me to put in. So I'll let you talk about this particular painting as well. Okay. Yeah. This is even more so. I think it's, it has a beautiful sensation of light and color, but also value. 
-hmm. And you can see that he's always trying to find colors within colors. For instance, the white dresses, there's no white paint anywhere in that painting, particularly if you saw it in real life. Mm -hmm. you, you would be able to see that they're, they look white to us, but there's no white anywhere to be found. It's all reflected light and shadow and, and such. Um, and uh, as you were saying, like I usually don't put figures in my landscapes because I want the viewer to be the figure. I want, when you look at one of my landscapes, I want you to say, I am looking at this scene rather than in this case, it's a picture of you know three daughters sitting on a porch or something like that. Mm -hmm. I want the viewer to be thinking, oh, I'm sitting on the porch looking at the landscape beyond. But he does a beautiful job with the landscape too. If you look at that, there's a wonderful sensation of space and you can see the distant blue of the land across the water. Mm -hmm. And he's really punched up that blue to a, you know, a really pure color, right. but it still reads as being in the distance and being, you know, three miles away. So yeah. he, he's, he does just, a, a, to me, he does an amazing job combining the figure in the landscape and this just amazing sensation of sunlight. And he, he does that by those little accents. The, there again, the black ribbons in the hair. Mm -hmm. yeah. And a little tiny black accent of a belt on her dress, the woman in the left. Yep. Right. That just sets off that whole area. If you took that out of there, it would look like a big white mush. Yeah. But by putting a little accent there, it, the whole that whole uh, area comes alive, and it also defines the shape that we're looking at. Yeah. And the more if you start there and look, then you start noticing all the different uh, cool at, cool atmosphere. If you're, Cool, cool temperature, excuse me, um, colors in here, the blues and the purples, and then the, even some yeah. of the, you know, the, the grayed down yellows, if you will. Um, yeah, and even this little bright. Uh, yeah, tiny, tiny, tiny accents, accents, but they're yeah. critical to the, to the painting. Yep, yep, wonderfully, wonderfully done. So love this, the red right here. It's like, yeah, all of a sudden yeah. I start looking around going, where's that coming from? <laughs> <laughs> and you can see that's next to the yellowy green and they're almost, you know, they're opposites in the color wheel. Exactly. So there again, it makes those, both of those um, areas really come alive. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I've always liked um, Benson's work too. So seeing it, seeing a number of them in uh, uh, some of the museums around and, yeah. and stuff. So. And it's interesting though, he has a lot of these, he did a lot of hunting scenes, duck hunting and such. I guess he was a big duck hunter. And they're not very impressionistic at all. They're more of almost tonalism. Right. The colors are much more subdued, which is an interesting twist on his art. And I, I haven't read or heard why there's that sort of disparity. But it seems more fitting to the subject, too. It's hard to, I think it would be hard to paint a duck hunting scene with this type of palette. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think I, the only thing that I found is they had mentioned that um, he had started off as a realist and then moved to American Impressionism after joining the 10 American painters in 1898. That's the only reference that I had about him um, actually starting off as a, a realist painter. So, so now we're gonna really embarrass Joe. We're gonna move to some of his work. <laughs> and, and the whole reason why I put these in Joe is if you're, you are more than welcome to talk about them, but I wanted folks to, that, are, that would be watching on YouTube to see your favorite master's work and then see some of your work so that they could see how you, um, you know, how your study of them has influenced your work. So um, these were uh, some that I pulled these off of your website. So um, again, Joe, um, Joe's website is josephmcgirl.com. So if you want to see more of Joe's work, please uh, go out to Joe's website and and check it out. So we have Candela and, and Harbor Lights. Anything particular that you want to tell us about these two paintings? Uh, there are a couple of New York scenes. I had a show at Cavalier Galleries that uh, was supposed to open in March of 2020. I mean, sorry, April 1st of 2020. Oh. And of course, everything was shut down. The gallery couldn't even open. So we were never able to mount the show, which was really frustrating because All that I work. spent quite a bit of time. Yeah working on it and I hadn't had a uh, one person show in quite a while and um, I was you know looking forward to seeing the paintings and all in one spot and such 
So anyway, um, <laughs> be that as it may, we had an online show and a virtual show and everything went really well. But that uh, would have been more fun to have a an actual in-person show. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, so so Candela was painted uh, from the Palisades, looking across towards New York. I've done a lot of paintings of the Hudson River and the Palisades area. It's uh, really quite a unique uh, topography and the juxtaposition between the architecture of the cities and the architecture of the Palisades is really interesting. Um, you get a lot of beautiful lighting effects, the uh, sunset and morning. You've got you know beautiful effects on the river and such. Um, and this was, uh, I was really interested in, you know, that portrayal of the beam of light coming down from the sky and uh, added some ships in there to further describe what I was trying to illustrate. Yeah. And a lot of times the objects I put in my paintings aren't there really for like, you know, sentimental reasons or whatever. They're a way to further describe the phenomena that I'm looking at. Yeah. Um, so I put a lot of boats in my paintings because I paint a lot of water scenes and there are actually boats there and they're good ways to explain and to interpret and um, sort of describe the quality of light and atmosphere and such that I'm painting. Right and we have the, we've had this conversation before where um, this to me and, and again it could be my monitor but um, this to me looks almost white the the on the water where did you go there you go um, right like through here. And I remember saying, you know, I was never allowed to use white <laughs> in my paintings. And yeah. you were saying, well, you can use it, but just sparingly, you know, we, we yeah. don't want it everywhere. Right. And this it's probably not, I don't know how it looks different in my monitor. That's okay. one thing okay. that drives me crazy about seeing work online is it, it looks different in every device that I look at. Right. It, it, um, absolutely. Yeah. There's a little bit tinge of yellow in that Yes. middle yeah. spot, just barely. Okay. And then it gets a little bit stronger as it moves away. Yeah. And one of the challenges with painting light is you don't have anything that's any brighter than white, you know, the same white paint you paint your walls with. Right. So you have to trick the viewer into thinking that it's bright and shiny. Yeah. And you do that by adjusting the values and the colors and the proportions of all the adjacent areas of the painting. Right. And so I'll paint things adjacent to it darker than they actually are in order to create that sense of light. Yeah. Because in nature, you know, we have in painting, you have a value. They, you know, typically they describe the value scale as one to 10, one being pure white, and 10 being uh, black. Right. But in nature, they probably, there was a value scale of maybe 20 to, I mean, um, minus to 10 to 20. Mm -hmm. So we're not able to operate in that expanded value range. We don't have anything as bright as the sunlight. We don't have anything as dark as a deep shadow. Right. So we have to sort of, make up little devices and trick people into thinking that what they're seeing is sunlight rather than just plain old white paint. Yeah, I was told we have 10 values and millions of colors. So yeah, that's, <laughs> choose wisely. That's <laughs> and then harbor lights, gorgeous sunset, lots of atmosphere yeah. here. Yeah, that was a New York scene, um, yeah. sort of partly made up, but partly made up of things that I saw. I see the Statue of Liberty there in the distance. Mm -hmm. Yep. And here again, I was interested in uh, the quality of light. And rather than having mountains or a river or something like that, I thought I'd have the uh, the New York skyline and you know some buildings and the Hudson River going up. Or I guess that's the East River where I was painting this. Yeah, the lights in the distant distance of the city across the water here too. Yeah, so that's New Jersey nice. over there. Right, and against yes. the the purple here. In yeah. The yeah. And there again, I exaggerated some of the colors in order to create the effect of light and atmosphere like that purple on the horizon on the left and how it transforms into a yellowy gold on the right side mm -hmm. which uh, gives the impression that the sun is right behind those buildings mm -hmm. and you know just sort of out of our view yeah love it <laughs> and then these were the the western ones that i was talking about that um kind of reminded me of um was it Gifford? I think it was. Yeah, that yeah. had the yeah. So um, starting over and the black hat. So I assume the, these um, actually kind of reminded me a little bit too of Edgar Payne, which um, I don't know if he ever had an influence on you, but probably does on all of us through his book. But um, yeah, so it's wonderful. 
Thanks. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of uh, Western scenes lately. Um, I t try to get out there at least once a year or, or so, sometimes a couple times, but it's um, just beautiful topography, obviously. Mm -hmm. And the reason I love it is the same reason I love the ocean and the coast is because you have this wonderful sense of space yes. and distance. And when I'm at the shoreline, I feel like I could get in my boat and just sail off anywhere I want. And the same thing when you're out west, you know, you can get in a horse and just ride off into the sunset. There's just, you know, just wonderful sense of space and freedom and openness. Um, that's why I don't do very many, like, you know, street, city street scenes or forest scenes or something. It's a little bit too claustrophobic for me, I think. <laughs> and I wide love, open space. <laughs> yeah. And as I was saying, I love, you know, creating that three-dimensional sense of endless space and a flat surface. That's one of the things that's always fascinated me with painting is we have this flat surface and we have to try to convince the viewer that part of that surface goes back, you know, five or 10 miles. Yeah. And other parts of that surface, you could just reach down and touch. So, and so that's kind of a fun game, I guess you would say, that I really enjoy about painting. So if I could get you to talk a little bit about edges and atmosphere. Um, I mean, when I look at something like the distance here, we've got what I would consider a hard edge. Maybe it's not because this painting's so big. I don't know. Uh, maybe it looks like a hard edge to me because <laughs> it's a monitor instead of me actually looking at the artwork. Um, so, and how the monitor and pixels are being interpreted. So talk a little bit about edges and atmosphere effects. Are we looking for soft okay. edges? Uh, some places, but other places now. Um, for me in the distance, it's, it's a hard edge because the trees sort of, as they move back into space, they sort of average themselves out and it looks like there's so it's just sort of a hard edge on them compared to like trees that are up close where it's much more meandering and maybe softer because some are picking up the light and some aren't. Mm -hmm. I had a discussion one time with an artist about hard and soft edges and his philosophy was that you have the center of interest hard edged and everything else is sort of soft because you know that's how you how you see and I said well if you do that then you you're making everything else outside of the center of interest doubly soft. Because if you look at the center of interest, everything outside of that is gonna be fuzzy anyway, because you can't focus on that at the same time as focusing on something sort of towards the edge of the canvas. Mm -hmm. and he disagreed with me and I said, okay, open up a book and read a word on one page and then tell me what a word on the other page is while you're looking at that first page. You can't do it because we, this is called the center, uh, phobia centralis, which is your focus area. And it's very small. If, you, if you're looking at a magazine and you're reading, you know, a word in a magazine, you can't really read anything else at the same time. Mm. So the same thing happens when you look at a painting. If I look at, say, I'm looking at the black hat, if I look at that rider in the, across the way on the horse, everything else is slightly fuzzy as I'm looking at it. Mm -hmm. But if I made everything else fuzzy, if I painted everything else fuzzy and I was looking at the horse and the rider, then everything else would be like doubly fuzzy, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It'd be like double fuzzy. <laughs> so by painting everything in the same degree of focus, as you look around the painting, everything else becomes out of focus and where you're looking is in focus, particularly if you're looking at the painting in real life rather than a, you know, a two inch oh, yeah. image on a screen. Um, so that's kind of one of my philosophies on edges, but I've also noticed that I've seen paintings from some artist friends where they do that. They have the center of interest sharply focused and everything else sort of soft. And you get a wonderful three-dimensional quality to it. I think it's maybe from us being so used to looking at photographs where you, you know, if you take a picture, a close-up picture of a flower mm -hmm. and everything else is blurry, it has a much more three-dimensional quality to it. Right. And I've seen some pain, paintings that have been, they've been doing that lately. It's kind of interesting. So I may explore that a little bit too, just for the fun of it and sort of the, for the sake of, you know, something different to do. Yeah, it, it, exploration is never uh, limited in our, in our line of work, thankfully, right? <laughs> yeah. And one of the things about the Western paintings that I like too is if we can go back to them. Yeah, let me. 
I did it. So go ahead. <laughs> So with these Western paintings, I really like the narrative content that I'm putting into them because I don't really do that with my other paintings, but the West has such a strong narrative story to it. And so, you know, we've all seen Western movies and TV shows and such and read books about the West. And it's fun to put these little scenarios and make kind of stories uh, out of them, which I, as I said, I don't usually do with my other paintings. So the black hat, I thought, well, it's a fence. And there's a cowboy on the horse in the foreground, and but you just see the shadow, which obviously means that you're the cowboy. Right. Like when you look at the painting, you should put on a hat because that cowboy has a hat, and that would convince the story that you're sitting on the horse. And you're looking at the cowboy across the way, but he has a white hat. So you obviously are the one that's wearing the black hat. And you know, Western lore, the black hat cowboy was always the bad guy. <laughs> so it's kind of the story is kind of like you're the bad cowboy. And then what's the story? Is they are they gonna say hi, you know, howdy partner, or are they saying, what are you doing on my land? Or so you can make up your own little story there. Cause it's hard to see in the computer screen, but the cowboy across the way has a rifle yeah, I see in his it. hand <laughs> sort of resting on his on his hip. So you don't know what he's gonna do with the rifle. Yeah, now so I, you could text this one out, Joe, and just put hashtag Yellowstone. Yeah, just, I know. Yeah, the Dutton Ranch, right? <laughs> yeah, and it's funny because I, I hadn't seen that series until after I had done the painting, but then I thought, oh, this is kind of like Yellowstone. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So and then the starting know? over is kind of the, the same thing. You can kind of make up your own story. It's hard to see in the screen, but there's an American flag on the on the barn right sort of right there. Yeah. And then you can kind of decide what's starting over, who's starting over. And I sort of thought of the cowboy has been off somewhere or something and he's coming back to his farm and he's going to start his new life cool i always love it too because everybody there's always the the conversation about putting in the telephone poles the electric wires and, and things like that but i think that's great because it does date it a bit but yeah I mean, you know anytime since we've had electricity this this place has existed or could have existed before it and they brought it in. So whole other conversation about that, that going on as well. Yeah, well a, couple, a few years ago, I, we had a sh uh, the Planar Painters of America had a show at the Tweed Art Museum in um, Minnesota. And they, um, the theme of the show was industrial America. Mm. So I did a painting uh, down in Florida in the uh, way out in the middle of part of the state of this farm this field with some cows below it, but above it were these high tension power lines, like really industrial strength looking. <laughs> and there was a thunderstorm in the background. And my whole idea was that, well, I didn't paint the industrial part of America. I painted the, the power that makes the industrial America possible. And then, uh, so there was this basically a painting of power lines. I had the cows below it because I thought, well, in the old days, the power was supplied by cows and animals and such. Now mm -hmm. it's supplied by electricity. And then the uh, thunderstorm indicated like the, all the, um, the, um, the physics of the like, um, electrons and such and electricity. And then we had the electricity going through the power lines. So it was kind of this fun little games I played. But anyway, at the end of the show, the Tweed Museum ended up buying the painting. So okay. you can put power lines in your, in your uh, paintings and people will still like them. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, that's, um, there's always the argument about it, you know, about whether keeping it or not keeping it. So yeah, I find it interesting, so. They also are great compositional elements because the landscape is always so horizontal, or often so horizontal. Mm -hmm. It's nice to have a vertical shape in there. Yeah, yeah, so, all right. So let's move on to the next two, your boats <laughs> and port yeah. of entry. Um, schooners of Mohegan. So go yeah. ahead and talk about that one. Uh, the Schooners of Mohegan is a plein air painting that I added the boat to. So is it plein air or not? Well, I, as I said, I contend that it's plein air because I didn't use a photograph. I painted the boat from my memory and my imagination and such. So um, that's why I would say it is a plein air painting. Okay. Um, it was painted in Mohegan Island uh, with a couple of friends who went on a painting trip a few years ago. And um, I was mostly interested in the, you know, this idea of the rocky foreground and the water. And it was basically a study of the rocks in the water. 
And that's what happens with most of my plein air paintings. They start off as just something to interest that interests me. I don't look for a, a painting or a painting subject. I look for just something that's interesting. And then I know that when I get back to the studio, I can either modify the sketch or I can make another painting using that information. Yeah, <laughs> it's okay. It's then when I get back to the studio, I can either modify the sketch or use the information there to make a completely new painting. Um, so I'm not always that concerned, but every now and then I get a painting like this one. And I thought it was kind of an interesting painting. I could put a schooner in there and it would be something I could put on the market and sell because that's how I make my living is selling paintings. So if I can, you know, make my planner paintings pay off, then I've experienced something, you know, wonderful. I've gotten some information for another painting and I can also sell the planner painting. Yeah, yeah. But we do try to make a living off of this, don't we? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, and then the port of entry again, you got your Lady Liberty and New York in the background. Yeah. Um, and this was, um, yeah, New York scene painted from uh, the New Jersey side. I think it's Liberty Park, it's called. Okay. And that's a pretty nice park, pretty fascinating. And I liked it because I was able to sort of combine my seascape with the cityscape, a little bit of the cityscape anyway, but it's mostly a painting of light and atmosphere. Right. And, um, you know, there again, trying to convey that sense of sunlight on the water. Right. Uh, it's Let's a theme I've been working on for a long time, and I keep seeing new subjects that are, you know, good vehicles to portray that phenomena. Um, it's just, it's something that's just always been fascinating to me. When I was a kid, uh, we grew up in Quincy and I could look out the window and see the sunlight glare on the water. And that always fascinated me even when I was a little kid, the sunlight glaring on the water. And the wonderful thing about sunlight on water is it's this intangible thing. I mean, you can't touch it. It, it, it's sort of this glittery moving thing, but mm -hmm. it's also sort of a shape too. And, and if you move to the side, it disappears. You can only see it if you're directly in front of the sun. So it's yeah. kind of an interest, this elusive, interesting phenomenon that I'd like to sort of explore and play games with and such. I like painting things that are a little bit elusive and um, yeah. sometimes it's sort of difficult to paint too. You have so and much was, going on here. It's, I mean, I know this is what really interests you was the, the like you said, the light sunlight glittering on the water, but you got this little bird and then you got your Lady Liberty and then the sky over here. It's, so you got like a little triangle going here and then you got this boat and then this boat. <laughs> so, yes, I had fun with the little elements, throwing little bits and pieces in there. And there again, you can make up your story. I mean, it's um, Ellis Island is to the left there. Mm -hmm. And the Statue of Liberty is to the right, so you can think of it as a paint a comment on you know immigration or, yeah. um, and then I have the man rowing in from who knows where as he right. row across the Atlantic, sort of a single figure, and mm -hmm. the man on the left standing on the uh, the rocks contemplating it, it all, and you know what is he thinking? And the pole on the right is a compositional device to get a vertical. As I'm saying, you need some verticals, and it sort of mirrors the statue mm -hmm. as another vertical feature the man in the rock and the buildings in the left so it, it's basically a horizontal painting because there's so many horizontal shapes but i put in these small vertical accents to break up the horizontality of it all because right. if you took all those verticals out it would be a really boring painting yeah. it would just be these horizontal yeah so it really talks to you know it really talks to designing that you actually you design the painting you don't you know, you naturally have a, a book of in your head how light hits on certain um, objects and, and different things like that. But then you, you pull all this together and um, design your painting from that. It's so really interesting. I, mean, I, I know you didn't get this guy to stand here the whole time you were out painting. So <laughs> no, the, uh, the whole foreground is made up. There were rocks. There was a rocky um, uh, there's like a walkway along it with a rocky embankment. So there there are rocks there, but none of the foreground was actually there as I painted it. Right. And, you know, the man was made up, the guy in the rowboat was made up. Mm -hmm. The buildings on the left were somewhat like Ellis Island, but I think that the Ellis Island was much further away. Mm, okay. I moved those buildings in to include them in the painting. And the ships were made up, you know, all the little details were pretty much are made up. They're elements that you would find there. Right. 
and there again from plein air painting in these locations you are able to observe these things that are out of the range of your view but you say oh hmm, there's like ellis island over there and then later on you say maybe i can include that in my painting yeah yeah and that's one of the things that um i had mentioned earlier in the, our discussion the artist ben ho in, in new zealand and that was the main thing that i learned from him when i watched him paint was he didn't say okay i'm just going to go and paint this particular thing he stepped back for probably a minute and just looked across where he was and picked different elements out from all the different areas around him so on his left was a mountain that was shrouded in a rain cloud that was coming in and on his right was you know another mountain we're talking new zealand down the south island another and then in front of there was right in front of him was a red roof little cottage and he moved everything where he wanted it to be to make it a, a more interesting design of a painting and yeah. that was probably the the biggest lesson i learned on that particular trip was you don't have to paint it just because it's there <laughs> you know you could you can take things from all different areas whether it's plain air or in your studio or wherever and and make it more interesting because you're designing thinking about the compositional pieces of that and um you know how to move the eye through your painting and, and all that and i think that um was probably like i said the biggest lesson that i learned when i was down there yeah so all right i think i don't know if i have yep that's it where we basically came to the end i said that we were going to talk a little bit about the pandemic um and how that's affected artists and and yourself so um you're still here i'm glad you made it through yeah. <laughs> so, and i also appreciate you being on here so Tell us a little bit about uh, how 2020 was for you. Um, it wasn't as bad as I feared. Um, you know, when the show didn't open at Cavalier, I was like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen this mm. year? But uh, sales-wise have been really good, which was a, a big surprise. I think, you know, people have been buying houses and they kind of put something over the couch. So <laughs> um, I, was, I was happy with the, you know, the sales have been continued. I guess the biggest thing is I wasn't able to travel as much as I do. I, do a lot of traveling, you know, being a landscape painter. Right. I love painting different parts of the world. So I've been kind of cooped up here in, in Florida. We drove to Florida this spring. Um, but other than that, um, not a lot has actually changed. There was a funny um, cartoon of um, an artist in the studio that was making its rounds on social media. And there's a, the title was an uh, artist before the pandemic. There was an artist painting in his studio. And then artists during the pandemic, it was exact same photo yeah. <laughs> or it's same true. image because, you know, I work alone. Um, I paint every day and that's, I work at home. So it's really, in terms of that, not much has changed. Yeah. So I guess the biggest thing is not being able to have the in-person shows and um, not being able to travel. Yeah. And not meeting up with my friends is, you know, I've a lot of artists, friends that, um, I meet up with every now and then and not being able to do that was a little bit frustrating but yeah it's nice having those discussions with other artists and what they're experimenting with and and what right. all that usually alludes to later on in a conversation so yeah so that that i think it was i think that part of it since we are such you know alone and and painting a large amount of our time that that little bit of time that we do spend uh talking with other people is is very important so um yeah I, I would see where that would be the thing that we miss <laughs> the <Yeah>. most <laughs> so joe thank you so much for your time um I know we, we went on kind of long but i think there was a lot of interesting things here that that we touched on and um like i said i do appreciate your time i appreciate you and and um thanks again for joining us right i was so you know, thrilled that you asked me to on and um it was fun talking to you. I hope the viewers and the listeners out there will enjoy it too. And thanks to, to them for uh, tuning in. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And um, if you get down to Asheville, look us up. Love okay. to have you and Patty here sometime. And uh, we'll, take, we'll take you up to Mount Mitchell where you can see as much atmosphere as you want. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's gorgeous. That sounds around great. Here. Yeah, you, you would love it here sometime. So um, yeah. don't hesitate. So. Okay. And that thank you. Good.
Yeah, great. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, remember that art chats are also available via YouTube. So if you're curious after listening to this, what uh, paintings we were talking about and referencing, you can go out to YouTube and find them. Um, again, please visit Joe's website. Uh, if you have any questions for him, I think he has a contact page there on the website. Um, so it's www.josephmcgurl.com. Dot com. So um, M-C-G-U-R-L is how you spell his last name. And um, like I said, if you have any questions for Joe or for myself, you can uh, drop us a note and you can uh, go out to my website, www.lindafistler.com. And there's a contact page on there as well that you can drop me a note if you'd like. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we ask that you refer us to a friend to listen to as well. And we'll catch you next time. Thanks, everyone. Art Chat is made possible by the support of the Artistics Harmonies Association. Create your next aha experience with us.